The recent sections gave us the background that we now can look at the essential LTE radio procedures. As in every mobile communication system, also an LTE a terminal needs to follow certain steps before it can receive or transmit data. Let's assume we do have an LTE capable terminal as shown here. And guess what? The first thing we need to do is to power up the device. Right after powering up the device, the UE will start with the cell search and cell selection procedure, followed by derivation of system information and execution of the random access procedure. This procedure is summarized and known as LTE initial access. After the initial access procedure, the terminal is able to receive and transmit its user data. Before we now look at each of these steps separately, we need to talk about the physical signals and channels used in the downlink. LTE uses in the downlink two types of signals. Signals which are purely generated in the layer 1, the physical layer. These signals are the primary and secondary synchronization signal as well as downlink reference signals. Further, LTE uses physical channels which derive the information data to be transported from higher layers, the layer 2 and layer 3. These are for example the physical broadcast channel carrying essential system information, further several control channels such as physical control format indicator channel, physical downlink control channel, which are required to inform the UE about scheduling decisions. The physical downlink shared channel is used to transport the data, as we will see any kind of data. The obvious transport of user data to the device, but also system information or paging information. Back to the first step after powering up the UE. For the cell search and cell selection, just the downlink physical signals and the physical broadcast channel are important. A successful execution of the cell search and selection procedure as well as acquiring in initial system information is essential for the UE before taking further steps in communicating with the network. As in wideband CDMA, LTE uses a hierarchical cell search procedure. The LTE radio cell is identified by a cell identity which one is comparable to the scrambling code which is used to separate between base stations and cells in wideband CDMA. To avoid an expensive and complicated network planning, the number of physical layer cell identities is with 504 sufficiently large. To enable the usage of a hierarchical cell search, these identities are divided into 168 unique physical layer cell identity groups, where each group consists of three physical layer identities. A jingle to remember this principle is to think about first names and surnames. The most common English surname is according to test statistics Smith, which would correspond to physical layer cell identity group number zero, for example. Align the physical layer identity now with the most common first names, for example James, John and Robert. These two types of information are now transmitted using two signals, primary and secondary synchronization signal where the primary synchronization signal contains the physical layer identity, so the first name, and the secondary synchronization signal contains the physical layer cell identity group, which is according to our jingle the surname. Compared to real life, where you use your first name first when you introduce yourself, also the terminal looks first for the primary synchronization signal, then for the secondary one. The computing of the cell's identity based on a modulo 3 operation means multiplying the group identity with 3 and adding the physical layer identity. Let's look at the two signals now. The type of signal which is used for the primary synchronization signal is a SAD of 2 sequence. SAD of 2 sequences are Kazakh sequences, where Kazakh stands for constant amplitude zero autocorrelation, where the name describes already the characteristic of those type of sequences. With a constant amplitude, a low peak to average power ratio is achieved, whereas zero autocorrelation means a good time domain behavior. When we look at the constellation diagram of the primary synchronization signal, recorded here with Rode and Schwarz leading signal analyzer FSQ, we will get this result. Can we extract the characteristic of the primary synchronization signal? Yes, we can. The constant amplitude is indicated by the new unique circle. The good autocorrelation can be observed by looking at each individual subcarrier carrying the primary synchronization signal. Subcarrier is a good keyword. 
In the frequency domain, the primary synchronization signal occupies 62 out of 72 reserved subcarriers around the unused DC subcarrier, which corresponds to the carrier frequency in the downlink. The remaining 10 subcarriers, 5 left hand side and 5 right hand side, are not used for any transmission. We can call them guard subcarrier. This helps to do match filtering, finding the right sequence used for the primary synchronization signal. As Christina explained, 72 subcarriers translate to 6 resource blocks, as 12 subcarriers are forming a resource block in the frequency domain. With 15 kHz subcarrier spacing, the occupied bandwidth around the carrier frequency is 1.08 MHz. By using the evaluation filter function coming with Roland Schwartz FSQ signal analyzer, you can look at each subcarrier individually. For the three different physical layer identities, three different set of two sequences have been selected, which have shown the best behavior. The one displayed in the constellation diagram is the sequence for identity number zero. The already mentioned match filtering works generally in that way that the received signal is correlated with the possible sequences for the primary synchronization signal. This procedure is not executed on the received analog RF signal. In fact, this happens in the digital domain. With successful match filtering, the device has identified the used physical layer identity for the cell as well as 5 milliseconds timing. Afterwards, it can execute the next step, looking for the secondary synchronization signal and the physical layer cell identity group to compute the cell's identity. Looking at the constellation diagram showing now the second secondary synchronization signal, we believe to see a pure BPSK modulation. In fact, the secondary synchronization signal is represented by an interleaf concatenation of two length 31 binary sequences. These two sequences are scrambled with a scrambling sequence depending on the physical layer identity, which is transmitted with the primary synchronization signal. So without finding the primary synchronization signal, the terminal cannot conclude on the secondary synchronization signal. The combination of the two used sequences defines the physical layer cell identity group. As the primary synchronization signal, the secondary synchronization signal also is transmitted on 62 out of 72 reserved subcarriers around the unused DC subcarrier. That is the frequency domain. So what about the time domain? When we look at the downlink frame structure explained by Christina beforehand, we can see that the synchronization signals are transmitted in the first subframe, subframe number 0, and in the sixth subframe, which is subframe number 5. So the repetition rate for the synchronization signals is 5 milliseconds. The two synchronization signals are always transmitted in the first time slot of that subframe, where the primary synchronization signal occupies the last OFDM symbol and the secondary synchronization signal the symbol before. The determination of the cell's identity enables the UE to examine the pseudo-random sequence used to generate the cell-specific downlink reference signals as the initialization of the generator based on the cell's identity and the used cyclic prefix, normal or extended. The information which type of cyclic prefix is used in that cell is derived here. The cell-specific reference signals do fulfill three tasks. They are used for initial acquisition, current demodulation and detection at the UE, as well as for channel quality measurement. To estimate the channel's quality and to help the e node B to find a scheduling decision, the network informs the UE via system information about the power level with which one the downing reference signals are transmitted. The UE is measuring that power level. The difference translates to a so-called channel quality indi indicator, a CQI value, which is reported back to the network. CQI values stands for a specific modulation scheme, QPSK, 16QAM or 64QAM, and which channel co coding should be applied to the data. In that matter, the cell-specific downlink reference signal could be seen as a lighthouse, where the power level refers to the height of that lighthouse. In the matter of cell search, the reference signal helped to, uh, the terminal to get frequency and time-wise fully synchronized. How that can be understood? 